This is a podcast by Householders Options to Protect the Environment, Hope Australia. We are a community environmental education and capacity building organisation based in Toowoomba, South East Queensland, Australia. This is a podcast in the series Eco Social Work in Australia. It was produced for Hope Australia in Toowoomba, Queensland, on and adjacent to the traditional lands of the Jarawa, Guyabo, Yugara and Waka Waka peoples. Hope pays respect to the past, present and emerging leaders of all First Nations people in this country and acknowledges the unique contribution that their cultures make to contemporary Australia. Hello, my name is Andrew Nicholson and I am the researcher and producer of the Eco-Social Work in Australia series. Within Australia over the last 10 years or so, a lot of the development of green or eco-social work theory and on the ground practice has emerged from within the social work training institutions. For instance, social work training courses at Charles Sturt, James Cook and Edith Cowan universities and some other training institutions have incorporated eco-social work ideas, skills and methods into the training offered to their students. This episode of the eco-social work series focuses on the work and ideas of one of the pioneers in that social work academic and training setting, Dr. Heather Boato from Charles Sturt University in New South Wales. Welcome Heather and great to talk with you today. Thank you, Andrew. It's really great to be here. Look, can we start the conversation by you introducing yourself a bit further? Give us an overview perhaps of your professional background and also how you first came to develop your interest in green or social work, this exciting and still evolving body of ideas and practice within the social work mainstream? Well, um, I can probably trace my interest in eco-social work right back to my childhood experience, to be honest, um, of growing up in rural New South Wales, where I developed a real connection with the natural environment. Of course, not that I knew that it would one day relate to eco-social work. Um, I spent a lot of my time outdoors, uh, building cubbies, climbing trees, as a lot of kids did um, back then, as well as doing a lot of farm work with my family. Um, Not to romanticise that experience though, um, we also had some tough times, many to do with climate, such as drought and bushfires and, it really was or oh, these experiences, I think, that caused me to develop a, a real sense of awe and respect for nature. And then as I embarked on a social work career in my nearby regional town, I noticed a link between climate and the well-being of, of people, particularly at the turn of the century when we had a major drought. Um, again, not that I realised that there was such a thing as eco-social work um, even at that stage. It really wasn't until I embarked on my academic career at Charles Sturt that I had the opportunity to reflect on these experiences and to link up with people who were like-minded. Um, and then as climate change became more widely understood, it seemed blatantly obvious actually to us apart that apart from a few people in social work, that we'd largely missed how important the natural environment actually was all along. That's really interesting to hear that personal story. So often with the guests on this series and other series that we've uh, done is, you know, that that personal story <clears throat> links in so well to the ongoing, you know, present day sort of interests, concerns or professional involvement. But look, let's mm. now go to definitions to help set the scene, because I think, you know, that that idea of language and terminology is very important, especially for a new and evolving sort of sector. So can you explain for us what exactly is green or eco-social work? And as a matter of expression, do these two terms mean the same or different things? Because you you tend to hear them used often almost interchangeably, but I'd be interested for your view on that. Mm, That's a good question. So eco-social work is underpinned by the idea that human health and well-being are dependent upon a healthy natural environment. So that means that our well-being as humans hinges upon or is interdependent with the well-being of the natural world. And to put that simply, eco-social work endeavours to help humanity create and maintain a healthy environment. And given that the environment is not doing so well at the moment in the context of climate change, then this is having a negative impact on human health and well-being. And when I say environment, um, I mean the natural environment made up of the biosphere. 
So in that sense, I think eco-social work is about promoting environmental sustainability um, while also addressing the adverse impacts of climate change um, on people and communities. In regards to terminology, I think that's a really great question too. Um, I think the, the jury's still out actually. There, there's been several terms to describe eco-social work, including green social work, environmental social work and others. And I mean, generally speaking, these terms are being used interchangeably. Uh, and I think that there are some pros and cons for each one. So for example, green social work can be associated with green political parties, and that can be a good thing and maybe a not so good thing. And likewise, eco-social work, apart from being quite a mouthful to say, can, it can have different meanings for different people as well. Um, but look, to be honest, um, I think eco-social work is social work and I'd like to think that we can get to a stage where our social work practice base is inclusive of eco-social work aspects without the need for those kinds of labels anyway. Well, that's thinking, maybe. <laughs> well, no, no, I think it's good, you know, definition of terms, not to get into some arcane discussion about, you know, the evolution of language, but I, I've chosen to go with eco-social work for the title of this series. But I think just to split the difference for the rest of this episode, we'll, I'll just use both terms so that, you know, just to demonstrate a democratic principle. Mm. So look, coming back to the matters at hand, you've just referred to climate change and perhaps understandably, uh, recent interest in green or eco-social work practice issues do seem to have developed particularly strongly around the problems of uncontrolled climate change. And I have a number of linked questions on that particular uh, topic. So firstly, can you say something about the particular relevance of social work action and intervention linked to climate change impacts and risks? Hmm. Well, social work action regarding climate change is incredibly relevant. Um, we are a profession that are committed to uh, social justice and climate change exacerbates inequities across a number of sectors. So, for example, many of the people that social workers engage with on a daily basis are at an increased risk of experiencing inequities as a result of the impacts of climate change. And to be honest, many marginalised groups are, as in present tense, already, you know, experiencing um, these negative impacts. And an example of this um, would be the increasing intensity and frequency of heat waves in Australia. Um, it's causing higher mortality rates, particularly for those with existing health issues, um, but also for newborns, for older people, for people living in public housing with little insulation and poor air conditioning. Uh, in fact, heat waves also increase the rate of crime um, and domestic violence, which in New South Wales, uh, for example, during the 2019 heat wave was about three and a half times higher, uh, particularly in rural areas than usual. And we're just talking about heat waves here. I mean, there's a whole um, range of other climatic events that are having, you know, large scale impact on our social, our health and our economic um, well-being. Um, but more than this, I think as social workers that we do need to be more proactive. So rather than reactive to climate change impacts, which is what I've just focused on, I think as a profession, we have a lot more to do in terms of climate action um, towards um, addressing issues associated with climate change. So I think, you know, once we establish the interdependency between human well-being and climate change, then there really should be no stopping us in terms of our vision to improve human, human well-being. And therefore, you know, action um, towards addressing climate change. That's interesting. I, I know other guests in this series, at least one other guest who happens to work in the hospital sector, a social worker in the hospital sector, is, you know, talks about that approach to public health concerns around climate change and how social work practice within the hospital sector might start to adapt to that, for instance, in terms of the type of risk assessments that hospital-based social workers might undertake at the time of discharge of patients around heat wave um, you know, events and stuff like this. It does seem that that public health um, hospital sector is one of the, again, one of those areas where a lot of uh, social work interest as it is evolving, you know, is, is crystallizing around. Perhaps, you know, that sector employs a lot of social workers. So it's interesting. But look, staying with climate change, can you spell out why you think the social work profession should be involved with the climate change threat in 2021? I, I know that's a very basic question, but I think if we can, you know, start to unpick that, it would be illuminating. Mm. 
No, it's a good question. So, well, as I mentioned, social work should be concerned with the inequitable impacts of climate change on marginalised groups. I mean, this is our bread and butter in terms of our commitment to social justice, and I might add environmental and ecological justice um, to that. Um, with the threat of climate change intensifying, though, beyond 2021, um, we really don't have any time to waste, actually. We need to get practical and we need to, you know, to take action. We shouldn't panic, though, um, but we do need to transition fairly quickly. And, and I think we are doing that to an extent. Um, but moving beyond the emergency of climate change, many practitioners that I come across are actually quite surprised to know that our Australian Code of Ethics, as well as our international policy, obligates practitioners to promote the protection of the natural environment as inherent to social well-being. So in a sense, we have an ethical mandate by our professional body. Um, as a professional, I also think that we are really well equipped to address social and environmental issues associated with climate change because we have skills to engage at the individual, at the group, organisational, community and political levels in society. And and I mean, this multi-dimensional approach is, is unique to social work and it's really what is required, I think, to address the complexities associated with climate change. Um, I mean, I also think that our knowledge base um, is also well-placed to take a holistic understanding of um, human well-being. And, you know, ultimately, um, human well-being is dependent on the health of the natural environment. And since we know the natural environment is verging on collapse, then it's absolutely our business to be involved in this. I like that very direct link to the fact that, you know, all, all levels of society, including the professions, including social work, need to be onto this. Just staying with this a little bit longer, though, coming to what you might term the meat and plant-based potatoes or the other way around um, of what this actually means on the ground for social workers. I have heard a number of comments. Well, look, yeah, but what does this actually mean to me as a social worker in a particular work role? The AASW did uh, a, a sort of very interesting pioneering CPD course on social work and climate change last year, and there were a number of um, actions outlined in that. But could you, from your own perspective, outline some of the on-the-ground actions that social workers might undertake to respond to climate change problems in practical terms? Hmm. So this is an area of work that I've been focusing on a lot. Um, so that is how to translate what we know about eco-social work or green social work in practical terms. And I had the privilege of working with a group of practitioners along with um, a colleague of mine, Wendy Bowles, where we aim to develop eco-social work interventions on the ground in the, work, in the workplace. And, you know, the overall advice that pr practitioners gave um, to us was to start small if you need to, be creative when you can, and also to be bold when opportunities arise. I really think it's helpful if we view ourselves as a collective of social workers, each assigned to different tasks that make a bigger difference to a common goal. Um, some of us will have specific positions with an environmental focus, and I think these opportunities will increase in the future. And others um, find ourselves in more traditional sort of mainstream um, type positions. And I believe that each one of us can contribute to promoting environmental sustainability and addressing the adverse impacts of climate change, no matter what type of position we have in some way. So having Having said all that, some of the things, because I know you're after the practical um, aspect of this, and I think some of the things we can do in practice, which were tried and tested by the by the social workers that I engaged with, um, was to firstly, or is to, I should say, firstly, find like-minded colleagues and form communities of practice where we can come together, where we can share knowledge and where we can support each other in developing, you know, eco-social work. I think we need to create partnerships with environmental organisations. Um, we need to develop environmental behaviours in the organisations that we're employed with because many of our organisations, in fact, don't have a lot of activities um, that role model or support, um, you know, or um, environmental sustainability. I think we need to use social media to share knowledge and to create campaigns. And... If you're working in direct practice, then we can enhance well-being for the people that we work with by engaging with nature, because I think this kind of work is known to create stewardship and care um, for the environment. 
if if you work in group work, then incorporating the natural environment into programs is a really great idea. We had uh, we had one practitioner incorporate sustainable living skills into a group program, and um, she developed. Um, some activities around using baking soda to make detergent. Um, another practitioner incorporated nature mindfulness activities when working with adolescents as a way for coping with trauma. Um, the, you know, the list goes on actually, and I probably don't have time to cover everything, but we are a profession that works actively at multi-dimensional levels of practice and we need to implement interventions at each of those levels wherever we find ourselves and you know wherever we're placed and I do finally just want to say one more thing and that is that if if we're struggling or if I, if as practitioners we're struggling or to or to um, finding it difficult to connect with some of the things that um, I'm talking about then I recommend that we actually start with ourself, that we examine our own personal connection with the natural world, our own understanding of climate change. Um, and because I believe that as practitioners, if we can develop a connectedness with the natural environment, then we are much more likely to implement interventions that reflect environmental sustainability because we will have a comprehension or an understanding of the interdependence and the link between the two. I like that reflective framing uh, because you know even in the in the production of this podcast series, talking to some you know very experienced practitioners, it's clear that just simply being asked a number of queuing questions about what is green social work, what does it actually mean to you, how can you embed it in practice, that sort of question, I mean, has caused them to reflect and make links, and make connections, which you know perhaps is unsurprising when you think about it, but. In a very busy world, we're rushing about. Sometimes the, the opportunities for reflection seem to be vanishingly small. So I think that's a very important uh, point you've made there, Heather. So look, now as we're moving through this uh, podcast episode, staying with this um, ideas, some of the ideas you've already talked about, but focusing now on some trends. As mentioned at the start of the episode, uh, eco-social work practice is still an evolving, emerging field within mainstream social work. You've been one of its recent theorists, practitioners and supporters in this country. So given that background, what progress have you seen regarding eco-social work practice diffusion into the profession here over time? And what are some of the challenges remaining to increase the existing level of take up? Hmm. Thank you for this question. Actually, I think it's really important to acknowledge the progress that we've made. Um, I'm sensing a real movement coming from practitioners in that they want to know how to do this. Um, I think that practitioners are experiencing firsthand the impacts of climate change on the lives of the people that they're working with. And um, as a result, I think we are becoming more involved um, in eco-social work, in climate action and in advocating um, for environmental sustainability. As you mentioned earlier, um, in 2020, we had our first national course offered to practitioners in Australia um, by the AASW. And I think that was quite a landmark um, um, opportunity and activity um, for us. And I think that the AASW have developed structures to ensure um, that we continue to influence the government and policy. And this is happening internationally as well. So not just in Australia. So it's almost, it's like a global movement within the profession. And I think that's reflected in some of the policy of the International Federation of Social Workers, the IFSW. So there is a real movement and a real sense of urgency and that progress has made some changes. Um, to add to this, there are some universities who are now offering content uh, on eco-social work. And I think what that means is that we're going to have a new wave of social work graduates, you know, with knowledge and skills um, in this area. And I think that's a really important thing to do. In terms of challenges though, um, one of the biggest challenges that the practitioners um, that I worked with um, talked about were the constraints that they experienced within their employing organisations. Um, so in particular, many organisations are um, kind of like restrained by short-term funding contracts, which don't allow for work that sort of always promotes environmental sustainability. Uh, and this was really, really challenging. However, on the other hand, in some cases, there were organisations where 
this became quite a strength, um, particularly for smaller organisations who are more adaptable to change, more open to um, doing things differently. So, um, but having said this, um, you know, these organisations, um, you know, or the, sorry, these organisational challenges, I should say, are not necessarily any different, actually, to some of the other challenges that we might experience um, in practice. So, for example, neoliberalism um, and even some of our social justice issues. Um, so I think we're really well equipped to take, you know, climate change challenges on board. And I think um, that the future will allow more room for us um, to move into this sort of eco-social work and, and climate change focus. That's a very thought-provoking assessment of the state of play of eco-social work adoption to date. Just staying with this present into the future focus, another topic area, there's been a growing interest in what Australian First Nations and Indigenous knowledges might bring to the climate change debate generally. For example, around the potential for more effective bushfire management through the use of cultural burning. I know this is an area, Indigenous knowledge is of great interest to yourself and your colleagues. So more widely, how do you see Indigenous knowledge affecting or influencing uh, eco-social work practice? Mm. Well, of course, um, Indigenous knowledge is a central, you know, to promoting and maintaining sustainable ecosystems. In Australia, to be quite honest, I think we've been a little slow and patchy in acknowledging the significance and the brilliance, actually, of Indigenous knowledges. Um, you know, Australia is a colonised nation, as we know, um, and for years we've experienced policy and processes that, you know, intentionally marginalise um, and devalue Indigenous knowledges. There are some glimmers of light, though, and, you know, in some places this important knowledge, uh, knowledge is being uncovered, it's being revealed and listened to, and there are some genuine efforts taking place um, you know, to collaborate, to partner, and in some cases to give control back, you know, to First Nation communities in care of country. Um, so, for example, we've seen sustainable Indigenous enterprises, collaborative uh, co-management practices, regeneration um, projects of, you know, water quality and land and so on. Um, you know, it's, I think it's really important, actually, that white Anglo-Australian social workers listen deeply um, and develop meaningful relationships with First Nation Australians and to understand the sacredness of Indigenous spirituality um, in relation to the natural environment. I also think, though, that we need to be careful because we don't want white Anglo-Australians or non-Indigenous people, including social workers, to misappropriate Indigenous knowledges or misuse their knowledges because I think then, you know, we would be perpetuating the colonisation processes um, you know, which we don't actually, you know, want to do. <laughs> mm. Very, very sort of um, pertinent point there. And staying with potential influences onto eco-social work practice, but from a very distinctly different source, have you any thoughts about the experience of the COVID-19 pandemic? Uh, you know, clearly such a major issue um, over the last 12 months and, and beyond, it's going to be beyond uh, the potential lessons to be drawn from COVID-19 and possible influences onto eco-social work practice going forward. Mm, it's been a huge thing, hasn't it? And uh, in Australia and throughout the world, you know, obviously there's been an increasing demand for social work services throughout the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, you know, community members have been seriously impacted on various fronts, economic, social and emotional. And I think in particular, um, we've seen an increased demand in mental health, in housing, uh, family violence services and so on. Telehealth services, you know, as well have been expanded to help people in need during periods of isolation um, within their homes. Um, and I think it's important to note that the pandemic, pandemic has exacerbated inequalities for certain sectors of the community. So for those living alone, for young people, for women, um, single parents, and actually it's also created unexpected hardship for other sectors, I think, such as middle income earners who have lost their jobs, especially mature age people. Um, I think that there are a lot of aspects we also haven't had a chance to consider with regard to grief and loss. So not only of loved ones who have lost their lives due to the virus, but also grief associated with lost relationships, um, lost opportunities with the outdoors um, and our, ch our changes to our plans. And I have to say more broadly, um, 
and I don't want to sound too academic here, but to me, the pandemic highlights the relationship between humans and animals through what is known as zoonotic diseases or animal-born diseases. And it really does show a need for us to expand our focus in social work um, on individual and social systems sort of towards more broadly to the inclusion of the natural environment and holistically speaking, how we engage, you know, with the natural environment and, and how we want to develop our future um, in that regard. And Heather, as we come to the end of this great discussion, I want to stay with that sort of general theme of what the future might hold for eco-social work interventions, green social work practice. I know that research academics and educators deal primarily in data and facts, but nonetheless, I should like you to don your visionary thinking cap for a moment and look into the future, say the next 10 years, midterm future. Across that time, what is your vision? What do you think the future might or could hold for Australian eco-social work interventions on climate change and other sustainable development challenges? What could the mainstream social work profession here in Australia look like in, say, a decade if it were to incorporate much more of an eco-social work approach into its practice? Hmm. I like this visionary question. It's not often that um, I have the opportunity to make a comment on such a clean slate for what, you know, what we could envision in the next 10 years. But look, my vision would be to have eco-social work become a fundamental part of social work practice so that social workers in the mainstream have accepted and taken on the challenge of participating as a collective to address the impacts of climate change and to engage, you know, in action to promote environmental sustainability. But, but this isn't the sole responsibility of practitioners. You know, there are people in education um, like myself and policy um, that need to facilitate this process really strongly. Practitioners are really busy people working on the front line and we need to work as a collective to enable and empower um, practitioners in this context. So we need to, to build capacity, I think, as a collective. I also think that we need to develop some structural change, both within the profession and also outside the profession. So I know you said visionary in the next 10 years. This doesn't mean that we start on this later. It means that we actually need to start now so that in 10 years' time, we're sitting in a slightly um, sort of different situation. So, for example, while the AASW and the IFSW, so that's our sort of national body and our international body, um, have made significant policy change, we need lots more. You know, I'd like to see environmental sustainability embedded in our teaching standards, in our field education standards, and to be much more visible um, in our other policy documents. I also think that, you know, we sometimes get locked into our sort of everyday, you know, going from A to B type of role in social work. And I think we need to engage with international policy and we need to enact our global citizenship responsibilities, um, you know, in our local practice. And we need to start sort of harnessing our, um, you know, the sustainable Deve development goals, for example, you know, and other international policies that I think can help us move forward and facilitate um, yeah, our practice. Well, Heather, it will be very interesting when we come back uh, older and wiser in 2031 and I, I sort of interview you for the follow-up <laughs> show. We'll just see how many of those visionary ideas got off the ground. It's fantastic, though, to hear that. But, you know, staying with that idea of the vision and perhaps that backcasting process of working back from the vision to the present, you know, you've already pointed to some, some steps there. But thinking about the short-term future of the next, say, two to three years, do you have any ideas about the immediate next steps the profession here could be or should be taking to move us towards that vision of, of more incorporation and adoption of eco-social work practice? Yes, uh, I think we need to, I think we do need to start working on some of the things I've just mentioned so that in 10 years we're going to get there. Um, but beyond that, I think we need to respond to the immediate demands as they present to us and in some cases and at certain periods of time, that can be quite overwhelming. Um, I think we need to roll out more training 
Um, we need to develop some communities of practice where social, I think I mentioned before, where social workers can come together to share information, to support each other in our endeavours towards eco-social work. We still need to distill some of the practical aspects of eco-social work, and I'd really like to be able to engage with practitioners some more to make this happen, um, as well as develop partnerships with other organisations and people. I think that while we have a lot to offer to these partnerships, whether that be sort of interprofessional or intersectorial partnerships, we also have a lot to learn. So, for example, I think we need to develop some literacy and some further understanding on environmental matters um, in our profession if we're going to take this more holistic approach. Um, we need to engage with the things that are going on around us um, and take a holistic perspective on climate matters. You know, we are, after all, in it together. So I think, for example, we need to engage with climate policy, what of it there is in our own country, you know, at the federal and state levels. Um, and I think that each one of us as individuals need to connect with this issue at a really deep and personal level. And then I think we can move forward to climate action as a collective. Eva, that's been a great set of suggestions, a set of steps that we could take in the immediate future. And that wraps up this very useful and interesting discussion and conversation. It's been an absolute pleasure to talk with you today. I'm certain you've given our listeners some great ideas which could help inform their own thinking and help them start further conversations themselves on the subject of eco-social work adoption with their friends, colleagues, employing organisations or within their professional associations. So it just remains to say on behalf of the Householders Options to Protect the Environment organisation who auspiced this episode and the series, I want to thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Andrew. It was a pleasure to be here. You've been listening to a podcast episode in the series Eco Social Work in Australia, produced for Householders Options to Protect the Environment. Please consult the episode text notes for possible references to topics discussed and relevant contact details should you wish to respond to anything you've heard. My name is Andrew Nicholson, producer of the series, and thank you for listening.